I'll just go ahead and I'll do a quick intro for Erin. Um, so Erin is with Delivery Hero. She's the global head of conversion rate optimization there, um, which is the worldwide leader for online food delivery, if you're not familiar with Delivery Hero. Um, with 13 years of experience in product management and strategy, she currently works with local Delivery Hero teams around the globe. She shares best practices for product optimization, growth and A-B testing with a focus on data-driven results and building a great customer experience. And sorry, I know we're running early. Um, but please welcome Erin McLean, where she'll discuss accelerating in-app conversions and monetization. All right, so just a quick intro, intro for those of you who joined. I'm Erin McLean, head of conversion optimization at Delivery Hero. Delivery Hero is the world's leading uh, provider of online food delivery. We operate in over 40 markets around the world. And for example, in 2016, we processed 171 million orders. Uh, and late June, early July, we went IPO. Uh, we're going to talk about a lot of the themes that have been going on today. But the area I'm going to focus most on is example case studies. So I'm going to give you real life examples of things we've done with our apps to accelerate conversions and orders and monetization. Of course, before that, as everybody's mentioned, is establishing a data-driven culture. Um, this has to happen from the top down. So we need to make sure that the business leaders are challenging the product owners to validate the decisions they're making. Um, releasing a feature isn't a measurable, measurable goal or OKR. Um, it's actually about the, uh, you know, the metrics related to it. So just having a release when you can't prove what its impact is being isn't success. And testing should be a part of the normal product life cycle. So everything that changes can and does impact the customer experience. So we have occasionally we've had teams who said, oh, this isn't a big change. We just we changed all the colors and all the fonts. No big deal, right? Um, but it is a big deal. And we do need to find out exactly what impact it's having. Uh, the next is turning problems into opportunities. Um, and we've talked about funnel visualizations at Delivery Hero. Our funnel is usually a home screen where you enter your location, followed by the restaurant list, um, all the available restaurants who are delivering, the menu, checkout, and the order. Um, so we use the funnel visualization to look at all the data and say, where are we losing the most customers? Um, and based on that, we can turn that problem and say, OK, maybe we're losing the most people on the restaurant list. Um, and why is that happening? And then we develop our hypotheses based on that, and we can project how can we improve this area of weakness. And of course, in, in order for any uh, data-driven or experimentation company to be successful, it's all about validation, iteration, and growth. Um, so test, learn, whether it's uplifts or downlifts or nothing happens. We learn every time, and we learn about our customer behavior, and we learn how well we know our customers or not. Uh, and then, of course, repeat and share, uh, especially in the case of Delivery Hero. Um, we have so many teams around the world who are all essentially doing the same thing, like selling pizzas. But we're all doing it in a slightly different way. Um, and there's a lot of things we can learn from each other. So we're going to get right into our case studies. Um, I will. After each case study, I'll ask you guys for a show of hands to see which one you're going to vote for. Um, and we'll go through these examples. This is our app in the UK. And this is the menu page. So you can see all the pizzas there are immediately displayed when you get into the menu. And the problem in this case uh, was two sides. On one side, customers were complaining about the length of the menu pages and all the scrolling. And on the other side, we were, they were seeing a high drop off rate right here. So the hypothesis is that changing to an accordion-style menu, where you click on each category to expand it, um, can keep the customer more focused and enable them to make decisions easier, ultimately leading to more click-throughs to checkout, as well as more orders. Oh. <laughs> and I clicked a little too fast there, but you can see the, <laughs> the winner was uh, variation one. Um, and in this case, we saw about a 4 and a half relative increase in order conversions as well as the click-through rate. And just to note, every time I talk about uh, relative increases, they are statistically significant. So 
Um, and for us, it's statistically significant is 95% or above. Um, and the key learning from this was, number one, solving usability issues, and number two, solving internal debates, because I think this is also something that can change according to, um, I mean, I think this is something that can be tested regularly as well, because customer behavior changes from year to year, and maybe later uh, they like to scroll more, or maybe in one market we have always have shorter restaurant menus, so it's easier to uh, digest. So it's really important to test. Um, case study two is one of our apps in South Korea. Um, and the, the market here is a little bit different. Um, it's big in South Korea to be able to click to call. So on the bottom you can see there's two call to actions. Uh, the one on the left is click to call and the one on the right is ordering online. For our business, ordering online is the most important part. So they wanted to adjust the CTA button for online orders. Um, they did previously test removing click to call, but they saw a decrease in their overall orders by this, so this was a problem. So maybe they could still increase online orders while not impacting the click to call. And they did three variations. Uh, the first one kept the control state of the uh, click to call button with the, both the icon as well as the text. Uh, you can see right here. And then the second one just has the phone icon, and the third one just has the text for click to call. So, quick show of hands. For the original, variation one, couple, two, question. oh, lots. Question. Variation three. I have a yeah? What, what? Metrics, target metrics. Metrics, uh, increasing online orders while not decreasing the click to call. And uh, so I think the most votes were for variation two. The winner is variation three. So I, I would have also voted for variation two. I think it's super clear and it communicates to customers, but apparently the text was important. Um, and although um, in this case, variation two was also very successful, um, but variation three was stronger. So variation three showed uh, about a 10% increase in relative increase in click-throughs and a 9% relative increase in orders. Um, and the key learning here is that in order for changes to be successful, sometimes the existing design needs to be modified. So even though it was successful and we got more orders by increasing the size of the online order CTA, we couldn't just squeeze it in. Um, we had to make some changes to make it work. Case study three. Um, we are back on the restaurant list. So this is after the customers entered their location. This is the restaurants that are delivering to them. And uh, you can see the restaurant logos. The problem here is that the restaurant logos don't actually provide helpful information about the quality of the restaurant. So if people are very visually oriented, you know, maybe they're uh, picking this guy on the scooter here. <laughs> um, uh, or maybe not, but maybe that's an amazing restaurant, and so the judging by the logos isn't the best way to make sure that the customer is getting the best quality. So we wanted to be able to remove the logos um, to help the customer make a better informed decision guided by ratings or reviews, and also simplify the page a little bit. Oh, I clicked a little bit too fast again. <laughs> um, so in this case, we actually had no change. Um, and this is something, it's been very different in many markets. So we test it regularly with different markets and sometimes it actually has a huge negative impact to re remove the logos um, and sometimes it doesn't. So we really have to do a lot of testing. Um, but in this case, the key learning was that we can use this as a tool to validate business decisions. So in this case, since there were no changes in the click-through or conversion, we could go ahead and safely remove the, the icons and make sure that the customers are choosing based on the cuisine type or the ratings, reviews, et cetera. Case number four. Uh, we're looking at the restaurant list again uh, in South Korea. And the, again, I mean, basically the problem in this one was about the conversions, click-throughs from this area of the funnel to the next step. So they wanted to remove some of the visual elements and trim the list. Um, there's, you can see there's two changes. Um, this, this one over here has four rows. I can't read Korean, so um, I don't know exactly what every line says, but uh, they, over here they went to three rows, 
And what they removed was the minimum order value. So to say you have to spend this much at each restaurant, they, they removed that, as well as this Sesco, which is a hygiene, food hygiene rating. They kind of simplified that to a little tag over here. And <laughs> no surprises, sorry. Um, <laughs> variation one was the winner. And it showed um, a slight increase in the click-through rate um, and a 2.6 relative increase in order conversion. The key learning here is sometimes less is more, and small changes can also result in big wins. And this is really significant, especially with our app in South Korea. You might look at these numbers maybe, or I mean, I think most of you are experimenters, so you probably know that 2.6 is a pretty big increase. Um, and especially with the number of orders we have in South Korea, this results in hundreds of thousands of orders year over year. So it's really cool. Um, and case five. So this is the last one. I'll try to let you guys vote. <laughs> um, this is showing menu items above the fold. So this is on the menu page. It shows some details about the restaurant, which when you're ordering online, maybe looking at the restaurant's address and phone number isn't so important. So the hypothesis was that they could get the customers into the menu quicker um, by showing the food items higher. So we still kept all the restaurant info. It's just that it auto scrolls down to the first menu item. Votes for the original? Couple, two, three, four. And votes for the variation? OK. The winner was the original. Um, so this is, again, why we do A-B testing. Uh, we saw a statistically significant decrease in the click-through rate from uh, the menu page to the checkout. The decrease in orders wasn't quite statistically significant, but you could see it wasn't headed in a good direction, and we didn't want to take that risk on our customers. So, yeah. And the key learning is unsuccessful tests are also important for us to help learn about our customer behavior. Conclusions, these are just the key facts that we went through um, along the way. Sometimes less is more. Small changes can be big wins. A-B testing can validate business decisions. Uh, make sure that changes work with the rest of the existing design. Uh, solve usability issues or internal debates by running tests. Um, and unsuccessful tests are also important. Um, I think just on the internal conflicts and debates, it was really helpful as a, um, in the beginning of my career at Delivery Hero, I was a product owner for the UK business. And we would do these A-B tests and then we would use them to validate which projects would go into a sprint. And the developers would be really excited about working on projects that they said, oh, this was a statistically significant A-B test. Of course, I want to build it. Um, so getting them involved in that process was really helpful, too. Um, yeah. And that's it. Any questions? That was really quick, wasn't it? Yeah, we're doing <laughs> good on time. <laughs> That's good. We've got lots of questions here. Um, so the most upvoted one that we have is, how does Optimize help you run these tests? Yes, Optimize is our tool for uh, all app in-app tests. Um, so the local development teams use Optimize to, I, we do a variety of using the visual tests or uh, code-based tests. Um, and we, we use it to you know, distribute the traffic among the variations, and then we also Qualify. When we're looking at results, we look at the data in Optimize a little bit, but we also pull all the data into our own system so that we could do a little bit more segmentation and look at different user groups, look at different user behavior um, on our side. Awesome. Uh, let's see here. We've got, do you notice that your problem areas tend to change after A-B testing on that area? Um, sometimes. I mean, not in every case. Of course, I mean, we're, that's why we're always looking at the funnels. So we're always looking at the funnels and using the data to inform what are the problem areas at this moment in time, because things are regularly changing, especially as we're testing and releasing. And yeah, so to me, looking at the data all the time is the most important thing. Actually, yes, a quick follow-up is how often do you reevaluate that funnel yeah. to determine yeah. that problem area? Is it weekly, monthly, quarterly? Um, I would say at least at least monthly, probably not weekly. I mean, we're always, always having it available. Got it. Yeah. 
All right, do you think all food delivery apps function the same way? As in, are there best practices or common things among all the delivery apps? Um, I don't think they all function the same way. I think they're, they have in the past. Um, it's, it has been very standard with this process of uh, the funnel that I showed you guys. But I think it's evolving and growing. And uh, you know, even when we talk about things like Netflix, there's a lot of learnings we can take from there and using search and discovery as a tool. Um, because customers shouldn't have to go through this mandated process. It should be more like machine learning, and uh, we should be able to figure out what you want before you even get there. So I think there's still a long way to go, but um, I, we do see some evolution in these areas. It depends on the app, and some of our experiments are based around that as well to try to improve the search and discovery so it's not so, okay, here's a list of restaurants, pick one. Um, try to make it more fun and more, smarter. All right. Uh, how do your region-specific learnings translate to broader wins, if at all? Um, sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. And uh, it's a very good question. Uh, and I think it validates the case for A-B testing. So sometimes when we learn something, we can take it and test it in several different markets and see the same result. And sometimes we don't. Um, so it really depends on the test. We did have one in particular that we, I think we tested in maybe four or five different markets uh, that we tested and it was successful in every single one consistently. And then we said, okay, this is a best practice. Everybody should just do it. So I don't think we have, have had a lot of cases like that. And mostly we just recommend that teams, you know, in local markets, everything should be tested. Got it. Um, how much money are these small wins worth to your business? I don't know if you can disclose that. <laughs> um, lots. I mean, if, for example, you could say like a small win is estimates like 10,000 additional orders a month. And depending on the market, this could be between 10 and $20 per order. Um, and then take the commission off of that. So. Overall, month over month, year over year, these are big numbers. So kind of a follow-up to that one is, how do you prioritize which tests to run first? Do you always start with the easiest ones to implement? No. I mean, uh, I think it's important that we're, we're looking at the values. So we look at both sides. Um, one is the ease of implementation, and that depends on the market. Um, sometimes the local development team, or of course, always in terms of apps, the local development teams are building out these features in Aptimize. Um, so it does impact kind of the development cycle, but of course we also have visual tests. So we do look at the level of effort, but we also do an evaluation uh, between us and the local team and gauge uh, what, what do we think is the impact of this test and which will give the most value to the customers. And then combined with that, we can have a score to get our ranking of prioritization. And I know we ended early. There are a lot of questions here. Do you mind if I keep I asking you? I don't mind you? at all. No. Okay, just making sure. Yeah. I don't want to feel like I'm interrogating oh, no, you. No, no problem. <laughs> um, what is your follow-up process to experiments? Do you continue to improve upon successful and non-successful experiments? Uh, I would say yes. Um, so, for example, when we first started doing ex experiments at Hungry House, um, we focused on the home page for a while. And this was before we were getting into the data-driven experimentation, and we were just like, we want to improve the click-throughs from the homepage to the next step. And we, we focused on it for like six months, and there's always improvements that can be made, and there still is. Um, so for example, uh, I think it was a year ago or two years ago that they tested running video on their homepage in the background. And I think that should be tested every four months, six months, uh, eight months, because this can change and you know, different videos could have a different impact or maybe it should be moved to a slide, like rotating slides, or maybe it should be a static image again because the customer behavior and feeling about those things change all the time. Um, of course, whether this happens or not is often dependent on the local team that's running that entity. Um, but yes, the practice is to continually focus on these areas and I think we always have new opportunities because the market's changing. Awesome. Um, how do you schedule the tests? How do you communicate to the teams which tests are running? Um, this happens pretty much within the local markets. So my team is based in Berlin, and our, our job is really getting teams up and running. We uh, educate them about Optimize. 
um, and we share best practices, um, you know, how long to run a test and all these things. Uh, just on that, our best practice is uh, between two and four weeks, which is our business cycle is one week, so our kind of best practice is about three weeks. Um, so w our team itself focuses on sharing the knowledge um, and communicating within the local teams when they're launching an experiment has to happen on their level. So since they're running the tests, it's up to them to communicate to their team that this is happening. So within the local product teams, this happens. Um, at the end, uh, we do have uh, our own kind of database A-B testing library where the local teams can go in and enter the screenshots and the problem, the hypothesis, the results. And it's a searchable database that you can go in and say, I want to see all the tests that were run on the menu pages um, on apps and get all the results and see which ones were successful, which ones weren't. So everybody in the company around the world can look at everybody else's information and what was happening. Got it. On average, how long do you run each test? That was uh, about three weeks. Can you share some qualitative reasons for why some designs won over others? Um, could you be more specific? You guys do like maybe like user feedback or? Um, I mean, I don't know if we have. Well, no. <laughs> um, I mean, why they run? Why they won is according to the data, but there's qualitative reason about why we run them. So we get qualitative feedback in order to decide which tests we run. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the data about the results is quantitative. So, um, but we do use the user feedback. Uh, we do a lot of user testing. Um, and that would be a step that comes before A-B testing. So for me, a best practice would be if something new is happening, we should be doing a lot of user testing, getting the information, and using it to say, OK, and we're going to narrow it down to two or three designs, and we're going to test those. Um, so that's our feedback into what we test. Got it. Yep. All right, let's do one more. Yeah. Can you give some examples of some projects that came into a sprint out of these tests? Uh, I mean, all of these. I mean, anything that's successful. So if it's successful, it goes into a sprint to be developed um, and released. Um, there's, there has been times that we've tested things. Um, we haven't done it as much, but I also like tests that are kind of a gauge of how much effort something is. So we haven't done it a ton. But for example, back in the day, um, we put a button on the menu pages that said, like, see photos. And when you clicked on it, it said coming soon. So based on clicks, we would gauge customers' interest about building out this feature. Um, and, and that's a good way to get user feedback or customer feedback about what, what do they want and is it worth it. So in this case, it wasn't worth it at the time, but by now it might be. So. Um, yeah. Well, thanks for uh, taking all those questions. I no know worries. it was quite a long time, um, but good job. Thank you, Aaron. Yeah. Appreciate Thank you. it.